Cool, so uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, I'm Zach. I don't think I know you guys much yet. Uh, I'm kind of teaching in the third year now only and abroad. Uh, so maybe one day we will meet uh, more formally. But today, evidently, it's uh, kind of a bit for interested ones. And uh, I think the title was, you guys remember Chaos uh, something? <laughs> Chaos something. Okay, so unconventional sound synthesis. One of the key words is no input mixer, which has a fairly strong tradition. In fact, uh, what you could say is that um, you know, certain cultures appreciate noise music as a genre. I mean, typically big cities. I don't know if you guys, you know, have this experience, like there is a noise gig. Sometimes we call it harsh noise if it gets really loud. But essentially we're talking about music which does not build on traditional musical elements, typically no rhythm, no tempo, and no melody, no fixed pitch, weird sounds and loud sounds. Some people experience it as very aggressive, it could be, but actually it can be very cognitive and very kind of perceptual and uh, kind of trying to, you know, depart into th another dimension in the sense that, you know, it's unheard of in terms of musical structure. In fact, the point about most of this music is that there are different conventions or different ways of articulating things. So. It's not necessarily music without detail. But uh, very often what you would have is that it is music without layers. Okay, so typically w the way we conceive of music is events that are played by certain instruments which are layered on top of each other, right? That's how we construct this. But uh, actually we have the means to construct essentially a single voice that is sufficiently complex such that it sounds a bit like there are drums in there, sounds a bit like there are pitched bits in there, sounds like there's a lot of noise in there. Uh, but actually it's a single sound source. Okay, so that's, that's essentially what I'm gonna show you, how you can get to these types of uh, single and complex sound sources. Um, and the most crucial thing is the mixer. Okay, so the no input mixer as a traditional approach to noise music uh, has to do with not using any input, right? There is no signal coming into the mixer. So essentially use the mixer as a sound source. So how does that happen? Well, the thing you need to do is you need to create a feedback loop around it. Okay, so you take the output, stick it back into the input. So what happens then? What do you expect? If I, if I take the output of the mixer, stick it into one of the channels, open that channel to the outputs and just push the gain, what do I get? Feedback. Yeah, feedback. So you get an oscillation. Okay, the system starts to oscillate. Um, would you know how could I potentially control the pitch of this feedback, Howell? Any, any, uh, yes? Yes, that's a very good idea. Yeah, indeed. Because what th the reason, th I mean, there is no initial delay in the, in the mixer, but technically the filters are working by phase shifting certain frequency regions. And in that sense, phase shifting that frequency region is acting like a delay, right? What's the difference between a phase shift and a delay? How far are you guys into DSP? Th the difference is that if I say delay, right, I typically name a duration in seconds, right? And I imply that all the frequency will be delayed by that amount, okay? If I say phase shift, I typically declare <coughs> angle degrees or radians, which means that different frequencies will be delayed by different amounts, right? Because a 90 degree phase shift, let's say, is a quarter of the period. So at 20 hertz, that's much longer time than 90 degrees at 10K, right? Makes sense, okay? So just, you know, th these things come quite close in terms of filters acting as these phase shifters, as these, you could call them frequency-dependent delays. That's what they do. 
That's why you actually mess things up with too much EQing and filtering. You're actually pushing the frequencies in time. Ever so minutely, you don't really hear it like that. The way you observe it is that the transients lose their clarity or their realism. All right, so, so actually, if you really want to assess the uh, transmission of a signal through a system, um, you know, looking at a spectral response is just marketing, really. It's much more complex than that. And in terms of doing it well and quickly, I can greatly recommend take some acoustical transient signals. Because you see, we have a very good reference to how it's supposed to sound, an acoustical signal, and we know immediately if it sounds natural or not. If I take a drum machine, right, well, who knows how it's supposed to sound? It's an electronic sound source. You don't have a reference. Okay? So transients are crucial like that. Cool. So we could do it with a delay. I don't have a delay at all. Uh, you guys want to get hear the sound or more theory? You're still up for theory. Let's, let's get a bit more theory in, okay? Um, okay, so it will be based on these feedback loops. Now, the interesting thing is, and I can show you, you guys like math? You like numbers? Oh, I have nods, yeah? I have leaning forward, that those are good signs. <laughs> uh, because I can show you how chaos uh, comes to exist numerically. Um, in fact, the point is that pretty much everything is a chaotic phenomenon. W what is chaos? What do you guys, how do you guys define it? I mean, other than the chaos in the room, you are aware of this being a technical term more or less. So the chaos arises essentially from complex systems. Uh, believe it or not, increasingly in biology, in all sociology, in all the sciences, people start to understand how causality can fail quite easily and how very often uh, causal models of uh, systems are just not great because as soon as you have a complex system, the causality fails. The historically first example of this is a three-body problem back in the day of Newton. So he realized that if you set up the equations for gravitational attraction between three bodies, right? It's a celestial three-body problem. Then you actually cannot predict the outcome of the system, right? So if I, if I set up, you know, if I drop a ball from the ceiling and I know all the parameters, I can actually predict the exact arrival time, more or less. But if I have three bodies with mutual gravitational attraction, I actually have no clue how they're going to reorganize, right? So it becomes a complex system already, right? And then imagine things like, uh, you know, human health or biology or sociology with huge amount of variables. I mean, here there is no even, not uh, just a single variable, really. It's just this gravity between three bodies, which is kind of making them interact. So it is actually worthwhile saying a few things about what it means that it's not predictable because it might be confusing, right? Because if I program this in a digital computer, then you could say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean unpredictable? I mean, it's, you know, it's gonna calculate it, right? But the point is that calculating it is running the model, okay? So I can run a chaotic oscillator. There are such things, chaotic oscillators. Brace yourselves, right? So I can run it and it will have evidently, you know, come to the you know, what happens next day, let's say, in the chaotic system, but I don't have a shortcut. That's the point. That's the point about non-predictability. Because if I have a trajectory of a satellite and call the chaotic randomness noise and kind of negligible and all the rest, right, then I can put it on a trajectory and I know where it's going to end up, right? But if the forces were different, if it was three bodies with fairly similar attraction force between them, then you don't, you can't do it. You cannot predict with a shortcut. You can run the system and then it does what it does, right? So that's this predictability thing. Um, 
Cool, so I'll show you, uh, maybe go through a few of these things. So how does this relate to randomness, right? So what is chaotic? It's unpredictable, but it is deterministic. That's the crucial thing. So I can run it as an algorithm on a digital computer. In fact, my random generators, you can imagine that a digital computer is uh, overly deterministic in order to just spit out something random. Everything that it spits out is deterministic. It means that it has a very strict causation. And random is this thing that doesn't technically have this causation, right? But the funny thing is that with a deterministic system, right, I can create this type of unpredictability, right? And I define it generatively. So I define the machine that does it rather than the actual trajectory that the machine performs, okay? Now, random as we conceive of it is unpredictable, but it is non-deterministic. That's our idea of it. And it's a bit of a philosophical discussion, really, whether that holds and why it does or what are the counter arguments. And typically, we define it statistically, right? Chances, spectra, all these things. Now, what we're getting to then is defining systems that will produce chaos, right? And these are what I tend to call strictly recursive systems, okay? This terminology is not always very clear or, or very well distinguished, especially because you have a lot of, uh, you know, novice people sharing uh, knowledge. So what you have then is <coughs> that uh, there is a difference, right? So if I do an iteration, this is my preferred way of using the terminology, I am looping things, right? It has to do with industrial production, right? Most of the things around me, this bottle, right? There is millions of exact same bottles. I mean, chemically not the same, but fairly identical. So I kind of reproduce using a blueprint, okay? So that's your basis for an iterative system. You have a blueprint, and it's interesting <laughs> to, to note that we are still thinking along the lines of blueprints, right? It's very interesting, for example, how in genetics, you know, some 20 years ago, everyone was on top of DNA, how it's the actual code that determines everything and everything is in there. But very soon people realized, no, it is the environment that actually grows the organism. It is just a set of potentials that you have in the DNA, in the code, in the blueprint. So more and more we realize that it's not about the blueprint, it's about the evolution, right? which means that there is something developing, there is something growing, and this is an, a recursive process, okay? So in contrast to industrial production, we have self-replication, that's how we multiply. We have parents and we might become parents, right? And we still don't have the tech to do an industrial production of a human, although probably do, well, who knows? Uh, things, thing, weird things, are probably happening. Uh, but in any case, this is the crucial distinction, right? So rather than thinking of uh, a blueprint, a target, a set of instructions, a recipe that you more or less fulfill, what you're thinking about is growth, right? You're thinking about, okay, and it's really interesting for music as well, right? Because typically when we make a track, it grows, right? It kind of over time grows and decays. But we are still thinking of this as an uh, archetypical process, in a way, right? It's kind of, well, it just has to do that. But actually, we're omitting to, often omit to see how crucial this recursion is. So what is recursion? Well, recursion is a feedback loop, right? So it is a feedback loop in a numerical system. Because if I have three bodies, uh, We'll see, maybe at the end, probably have some time for kind of questions and requirements or what are desires. I might show you some numbers. If someone says, please show us the numbers, I will do. But the thing is that the only thing I need to do, actually, the simplest way of getting chaos is establishing two forces. One is the force of growth, and the other one is a limitation and typically an inverting nonlinearity, okay? So this happens in biology. The simplest example, 
there are species, I believe, of crickets or other bugs. And what they do is that one season you get tons and the other season you get very few. And then again you get tons and then again very few. And it's a very stable oscillation like that in their you know, population numbers. So the reason for this is that in one year, right, let's say there is a lot of them. Okay, we start there. Now, so what does that mean? Well, it means that they're struggling for food, okay? It means that the predators recognize their dwelling, okay? So they are more fragile in a larger group for many reasons, and therefore it decreases, the, the natality decreases, and there's only a few left for the next year. Now, when there's a few of them, the predators don't recognize them, you know, the dwelling. There is tons of food. They're probably horny as well, right? and they make tons of eggs, and suddenly next year there's a huge amount again, and then again there is a few. So this basic principle of growth and limitation does it already. So if you have a small growth factor, you typically get a stable orbit. This is the technical term we use for chaotic systems because typically they go orbits. And I mentioned the three celestial bodies, right? So they're kind of links in, these are orbits. So you can get a stable orbit, which means that the number of whatever that is, is fairly constant. Now, if the growth factor increases, then you may get this thing that suddenly there is too many of them and they're very fragile, right? And then you get an oscillation. And if you increase the growth factor even further, then you get chaos. And this we see in numerical systems, in, in basic algorithms. So th the most simple algorithm like that is logistic map. So the equation is up there. It's actually very simple. So what you're saying is that the next value, so n plus 1, you see I we use the index to uh, denote sequence, right? So the next value, xn plus 1, is the previous value, xn times a. a is my growth factor, right? So if it grows, it's going to become larger than uh, previously, but also times 1 minus xn, right? So actually what I'm doing there, I'm creating a growth factor and I'm creating an inverting limitation. So this means that the second part of the equation, if the number grows significantly, then the second part grows even more. I mean, decreases, it, it, it pushes it back. Right? So it's a bit like a spring, you know, it's not like a solid wall, you just bang against it and there you are, but it's a bit like a spring, you bang against it and it throws you back more than ever. Right? And this kind of system, if you really push it numerically, but also in electronics, also uh, in uh, mechanics, they produce chaos. There's a lot of examples of creating chaos, which is, you know, for us it's like it appears random. That's how you can approach it in simple terms. But for example, if you have a water wheel, right? That's, a, that's an easily chaotic system in mechanics, right? So you have a stream of water, you have a water wheel with buckets attached, right? And if you have a slow uh, stream of water, then what happens is that, you know, they just start going around, they get filled, they get emptied. Now, if you push it, growth factor, right? Or gain in electronic, audio it's gain, if you push it and there is a feedback like that, then you overflow and the wheel is going to start turning forward and then suddenly backwards and you get a chaotic system that you cannot predict. You don't know when the wheel is going to change direction, for example, in certain conditions, okay? So that's what it is. And then actually we can describe this increase of growth factor with this bifurcation graph, okay? So what happens here is that we have a growth factor increasing horizontally. So my, when my growth factor is low, this denotes that at this growth factor, first of all, this is the value of the system, this is kind of the output value, but the fact that I have only one point means that it's a stable thing, it's gonna get there. By the way, if I have a system with this growth factor and I start it off at any value, right? Let's say, you know, I have a very stable species but I inject too many individuals in one year, if it's a stable system, it will actually 
converge, that's what we call convergence, kind of take a few steps, but end up exactly where the system is stable. In physics, that's your bowl and the marble inside, right? You can start the system at any point, it will converge to the equilibrium, okay? So these are your stable points, and then at one point, when the growth factor is sufficiently large, you get a bifurcation. So the orbit stops being a fixed attractor, as we call it, but becomes an oscillatory orbit, which means that this system will be jumping between two values. It's showing you the oscillation between two values. And then you increase the growth factor a bit more, a bit more, and then suddenly you get another bifurcation, and the system at this growth factor starts to oscillate between four points. And then another bifurcation, you get eight points. It's still the same system, right? Growth, inverting limitation, that's it. And then comes chaos. So once you get to this bit here, you see, whoa, there's a whole lot of points going on. Obviously, there's a certain limitation. You can kind of describe it, but it becomes unpredictable, the orbit itself. And then really funny things happen. At this point, you get a three-point cycle. You see, there's one, two, three-point cycle. And then that bifurcates further into six and all the rest. And at some point, you get a five-point cycle. It's mind-blowing. You actually go through all and everything just through increasing the growth factor. Okay? So that's, that's the kind of theory there, which, you know, works numerically. We may get to that. Kind of explain most of these things. So I think it's probably time, maybe as a last thing here, this is an attractor. Okay? This is an orbit of an attractor. It's a Hennen's attractor. We call these strange attractors. The funny thing is that uh, this shape is such that it is perforated. It consists of dots, which are, you know, the next steps. And the system will never touch the same dot again. So it's not a, it's not a filled line. You know, it's just dots, really they organize in this funny way and there is never the case that the system goes back to the same dot. So it's always doing something new, so to speak. And this then is, you've, s you've seen a one-dimensional uh, map. This is a two-dimensional one. So I have X and a Y. Obviously the plot is also two-dimensional. And what I'm saying, the next X is the previous Y plus one minus 1 1.4 X squared, which is the previous X. And the next y is just the previous x scale down. And if you code this, start the values at 1.1, you run it, you get this point. You run it, you get this point. Run it, this point. You run it a million times, and then you start to see the shape of the strange attractor. Okay? Because you see, the attractor is a word. I've mentioned the bowl with the marble inside. You know, that's a fixed attractor because it will do the thing. This is also a kind of an attractor, but it doesn't have a fixed outcome. It makes these shapes. Okay, so uh, that's the theoretical background there. Uh, let's make some noise, what do you guys think? So the first thing I'll do, you, oh, yeah, exactly. If we look at the, probably look at the camera for now. Uh, I think that, let's see if, do you guys actually, it zooms, yeah? That's great. Let's see if you can get some sense of what I'm doing. So <laughs> what I have then is a feedback loop. So I'm gonna turn my pedals off, which means that there is nothing in line. And then essentially if I push uh, the fader off, how much of this you see? So essentially I'm coming back into the first channel from my phone's output. Am I saying this right? No, actually, obviously through the pedal and then, yeah, I don't, this should be a throughput. In any case, phone's output into the channel, nothing more. And then what you get is some kind of whining oscillation thing happening. Okay, so I can play with the equalizer and as we said, it kind of pushes the phase, so it intervenes with the feedback, right? Now, 
that is a sign of chaos, okay? Intermittency, right? When things start to appear random, right? So if you just have the oscillation and it goes howl, right? It's like not very musical, although it could be, like uh, our dub sirens are horribly musical for some reason, and cops sirens as well at times. Uh, but actually this already, you, you hear that it's intermittent. There is some kind of randomness going on right there. Okay, well actually what I'm doing, I'm probably cheating here. Uh, I'm not necessarily cheating um, because it's things are connected up already slightly more complex. But it wouldn't surprise me, this is your feedback. So depending here, for example, now I'm twiddling with the uh, uh, frequency of the filter. You see, it actually likes this, this area. So one of the features of chaos is sensitivity to initial conditions, is the term that you might read or hear. But in this context, sensitivity to conditions, right? There's nothing specially initial about this uh, setup, uh, which means that what you get, you, you kind of expect this. So what you've seen is that for the 80% of my fader range, nothing really happened. And suddenly you get something happening, right? And Personally, I actually play out, you know, with large modules. Maybe you've seen the video that was posted as a, as a promotion. Um, in these situations, what I do is I set all my controls to be on that verge of chaos. That's where the things really start singing, right? And if you approach the chaos with, you know, starting to get complex multiple things, and you find these points, uh, many of these points, then the system goes totally berserk. You know, it, it will actually produce a full track of weird music, almost. You know, it seems like there is a kick and a snare and a, a bass line. It seems like it's all in there, but actually it is still a single sound source. It is still just a chaotic thing. Okay, so it can get extremely complex. Um, okay, so that's my... Uh, I, I mean, I can listen to this for a bit. You see very small movements do quite a lot. And here, here is on the verge, on the verge between noise, right, and the oscillation, or indeed silence, that's where you get more chaos, right? So that's why it's a really fun thing to play out because you're always looking for these small, small places where things are happening. See? If I go just where it's about to... You see, I can get, I'm kind of controlling the density of it in a funny way. Okay, so that's fun. Right, so that's your no input mixer already. There is no input, it's just one feedback cable. Now, what I'll do is I'll show you some fuzz pedals. So one of the things that I hope was clear in the announcement is that this mixer and the fuzz pedals from now and the Neutron are all available with Rich and Lucas. So I'm not gonna, I would love to, but I really have to rush off the day, so I won't let you come and, you know, do all the bits, but you can actually borrow this gear, you know, take it home and try these things. The video is hopefully gonna work out as well, so it might help you get started if you're interested in these things. Okay, so what I'll do now is I'm gonna kickstart the fuzz pedal. Now the fuzz pedal is probably the most non-linear of the distortions, right? It's typically rectification, uh, which means that a part of the wave is severely cut, okay? Now rectified. So uh, in an analog uh, context with, you know, module, pseudo rec, that kind of thing, we have devices which are called folders. And the difference there is, okay, finally I should use this uh, now that I've set it up, right? So what you have typically with the rectifier, come on, 
All right. Comes alive, but it doesn't update. Let's see. I think I have to be on this window. And then you can probably see it. Not sure how the camera will work out. Come on. I've charged you. You've charged me. There we go. Okay. So we talk, we, we typically draw transfer functions in order to explain a nonlinearity, right? A distortion type effect. So a transfer function typically has input axis x, output axis y, okay? And a linear transfer means that you actually have for every input value, you get the exact same output value. That's how you read these graphs, right? Now, what are the interesting special things here? So if you have a rectifier, right? What you typically do is you totally remove the negative outputs, you jam them all onto zero and you leave the positive bits alone. So that is kind of your rectifier transfer, okay? What you may get to do at some point is create things like uh, soft clipping. Probably seen this one before. So what does that mean? It kind of has a linear range here, which means that the input value will become the exact same output value, kind of linear, but then a very high input value actually yields a lower output value. Okay, so that's typically your soft clipping. Obviously, you're quite aware, I imagine, of hard clipping and all the rest. Now, the folders are special in that they have an inverting nonlinearity. So your basic folder will probably do this. Ooh, that looks like a new religion, like a new political. <laughs> uh, so what this does then, what do you think it does to a sine wave? Right, so if I have a sine wave and I clip it, you kind of get that, I imagine, right? But what happens if I fold it? Well, what happens is that when I overshoot the first threshold, it inverts, so it sends me back it's what I said about having a spring instead of a fixed wall. I don't bump against the wall, it throws me back. So I throw the wave back and then it goes back and then the same thing happens in the negative side. So essentially I get this. And you can imagine from you know, what you've probably seen already in terms of waveforms, it will sound harsher than your hard clipping. right? So it's harsher than hard clipping like that. Okay, what does this remind you of? Looks a bit like uh, astrology, Pieces. So, and then the funny thing about folders is that they get quite brutal because at some point you get this as your transfer function, right? So what happens then is that you run up and then you get this, you run down, you get this, up, you get that and so forth, right? So it really does does damage in that sense, okay? So folders would be a good choice for uh, inserting into a feedback loop, but for the lack of uh, having a Euro rack with folders here, fuzz pedals will do. Okay, so let's, let's listen to these fuzz pedals. Uh, I want to show you the webcam, here goes. Okay, so, uh, that's what we have, and then I put the fuzz pedal in. So evidently I have a few dials extra, and I'm probably able to get some rumble rather than... Uh, I'm probably bored of whining already, at least I am, but I'm not quite getting the rumble. So what I'll do then is I'll call into action the second fuzz pedal. So in fact, I wanted I will draw the circuit that I have essentially, uh, but with the second fuzz pedal, uh, what I get is then a bit more options. So here on my PFLs, uh, I'm actually sending it to monitor. Okay, so my first pedal is plugged into the phones headphones. I've tried with auxiliary, by the way, but it doesn't have enough juice, right? So for feedback to start doing weird things, you need gain. 
So the outputs the on this mixer are not as strong, but the headphone output is stronger, so I can run it through the headphones. And the monitor output is also a bit stronger than the auxiliaries. So those are my two outputs that I'm feeding back. And then with the PFL button, I'm sending it to the monitor or not, which means sending it to the second pedal or not. Okay. Typically, you know, <laughs> full on in red. Uh, disclaimer, soft volumes, never use earbuds for these experiments. It can easily make a you know, extremely high tone, if you're on loud volume, damage equipment, damage ears, can happen. Uh, also, uh, you can get DC signals if you do this. So you can get a signal which is just like fixed on three volts, whatever. So what happens with certain speakers is that the membrane comes out and stays out and then goes back and stays there forever because it just burned out. Okay, and also with the high frequencies, because we hear them less, I can actually put push 18 kilohertz tone here that will totally fry the tweeters. And maybe some of you will be like, I think I hear something. I will definitely be like, I hear nothing. <laughs> I, you know, I've spent some years with this. So what happened just now, it's interesting, I don't know if you see, you don't see this uh, pedal much. So what happens also with chaos is that a certain setting in terms of the dials that I have available does not guarantee the same output. So what just happened, I'll try to do it again to make it obvious, is I've dialed away from a certain setting, suddenly from a bassy thing I got this whining I dialed back, but the bass didn't come back. It was still whining, right? So that shows you how the system goes into an orbit. It, it has its own, we also call it regime, right? So it has a regime of operation, and you need to do certain things to make it jump out of that regime and land in another one. In, in mechanics, uh, multiple regimes, uh, you can visualize by thinking of two bowls and a marble. Right? So you kind of have two attractors, right? And you imagine that, all right, I have two bowls, right? And if, uh, if the ball is in the first bowl, right? And I have it tilted like this, the ball is still in the first bowl. Now, if I tilt it sufficiently, I throw it into the second bowl, right? Now it's in the second, and I push back, I dial back, but it's now in the second. So the system is in the same configuration. The dials are all the same, but the ball is in a different ballpark, right? Like that. So that's, those are interesting things that you can notice if you get into this. So let's see if I can get this. Okay, so actually you've just seen it, right? I can do it only with volume. Volumes are crucial, right? That's my gain stage. That's my, that's my growth factor, right? So you see, I'll push it, it get bassy. Right? So now I could say, well, listen, there we go. Both are at five, and this is the sound I get. Now, if I push it further, get into the whining, come back to the five, well, it's just about got there. But you see, now I'm at four, three, now it's whining. I'm pushing back, two, three, it is still whining. It takes a bit longer before I threw the ball into the second attractor, and then it does this. Um, I like this sound. I don't like the volume. I want more. <laughs> it's just that, uh, I'm not sure can I control it there. Obviously, the mixer has had it already. Um, maybe I shouldn't. Oh, there we go. If you don't like it, do this, and then I'll attempt to control it.
I'm lost. Oh yeah. So that's essentially the essence of it. Any questions, comments? What do you guys think? <coughs> Not bad? <laughs> I mean, for the fact that, you know, it is synthesis without design, right? It's, it's very immediate. For me personally, you know, I've started coding sound at the age of 11 or 12. You know, it's been a while. And back then, you know, you couldn't code much. You were coding single oscillator inside this machine, you know. And then through, you know, studying this and all the rest. And at a certain point, you're like, yeah, but if I can think of it, I kind of know what it's going to do. So what's the point? I mean, I'm not very impressed by being the God Almighty creator who is a very creative person and everyone loves their creativity. I'm not buying that discourse much. So I'm like, give me a system that is alive, you know, a system that I'm not designing, essentially a system that is stronger than me. You see, it's a bit like surfing. I mean, I can crash, <laughs> right? I can crash the speakers, I can crash the gig. In fact, it, you know, you, you almost become a bit uh, superstitious with these kind of gigs because, you know, you go to a gig, you just do a random patch because you know the principles. You know, I need the feedback, I need nonlinearity, I need some filters. And on one occasion, it makes an amazing show, and another occasion goes, and you're like, uh oh, please, please start, you know, where are the waves? I want, you know, I can't surf like this, there's nothing going on. So it's, it's that kind of thing. And then obviously, you know, in terms of uh, sound design, it could be a tool, right? For me, it is an overwhelming you know, thing called life and weirdness. And then design is part of weirdness. For other people, the life is an overwhelming design and weirdness is part of design. I'm not fussed by <laughs> which way around you see it or have it. But indeed, you see, the arguments are there to say that uh, everything around us is essentially chaotic, right? The, the causality actually works in the lab, right? Outside of the lab, causality is something we seek because we are so convinced that that's how stuff happens. So we see causality in everything and you see it very quickly, you know, how we find a simple explanation. Oh yeah, that must be the case. I mean, the whole scientific field of uh, physics and others, they have uh, a uh, assumption, right, something that you cannot uh, substantiate really, that a simpler explanation is more valid than a complex explanation. Did you ever think about this one? Wh who says that? Well, people say that because that's their intuition. So our whole scientific knowledge is based on this intuition that a simpler explanation is better than a complex one. And evidently we have a lot of tech which seems to prove that simple explanations work for us, right? But, you know, if I say, well, there is a 10% chance I will miss the bus, 
what does that even mean? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything really. You know, you're either missing it or not. You know, so we're kind of trapped in this narrative of seeking cause, seeking effect, and controlling the effect, right? And this is slightly different in that I'm not controlling the effect. You know, if I say, well, now I want uh, 132 BPM to come out of this setup, like a kick at 132, I cannot get there. I mean, if you say here is 10K, do it, then I'll probably lock myself in for three days. And after three days, I'm like, look, two fuzz pedals and a mixer, and you got the kick at 132 BPM. It happens, trust me, it happened to me on stage, right? But I cannot recall it, I cannot evoke it. I can surf it, I can steer the system and be like, oh, I like this sound. I want to be very gentle around this setting because it's doing something interesting. Or I'm like, oh, this, I don't like this setting, let's be rad and twist it away. So you're surfing it, you're kind of playing. The system is leading more than you are, in a sense. <coughs> okay? Cool. Any questions? Interests, points of interest. Uh, the next thing would be to get the neutron going. But in all honesty, shall we just grab a coffee? <laughs> uh, the thing about the neutron is that um, I, I've got it going. So... The, the nice thing is at least I'll say a few things because th this is supposed to, you know, kind of trigger you in a good way in terms of, you know, exploring this domain because we are overly, you know, obsessed with exactness, controlling system, controlling the balance of things. But on the other hand, we also try to give you some artistic tools, right? So this is evidently the artistic tool that is by the way, very challenging on stage. I have many friends who play modular synthesizers on stage in a solo setting. Uh, no, I am saying drug. I have very few friends who do that, <laughs> right? But I have many friends who have this gear, but it's like, no, I, you know, I don't dare. And what if this and what if that? I'm, you know, obviously having to make sure that I have an audience that will take it. Right, so I cannot go to a random club and be like, all right, guys, can I plug in my modular? <laughs> well, it could work for five minutes. Um, I I'm not sure if it is the case if I hold a world Guinness record uh, for the duration of a performance. Probably not, but I think it was six seconds. <laughs> right? That's the duration of time it took for them to shut me down because they realized, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, this is not going to sell more cocktail or something. Um, so it's obviously an artistic decision if, you know, go in this direction. But, you know, I think as a general understanding of, you know, the, the huge amount of things in music tech, I think there should be a pillar called, you know, noise right? Nonlinear systems, feedback loops, and things like this. So, uh, yes, the neutron, shall I, maybe, maybe I can make it such that you see, but the most uh, uh, funny thing, or the most exciting thing about the neutron is the patch bay, right? So it's what you call a semi-modular synthesizer. This is my patch bay here. Uh, which means that actually all the components are connected by default. But if you plug jacks into it, then you severe those connections and you establish a new one instead. Okay, so the thing should work as a basic, you know, analog synth. So this one has two oscillators, has noise, your standard thing, two envelopes, has overdrive, voltage control filter. I kind of assume you guys know this but if you don't there is millions of sources that will teach you tons about this in fact if anyone goes wants to go deeper i've done a few years ago uh, you know the elevator sound shop in on stokescroft they sell modular gear so we kind of uh, teamed up and i was doing ue courses there except it was it was called the noise lab it's long dead now but we had the noise lab and actually I had, I think I have it all uh, on YouTube as well. It's about six, seven, maybe eight lectures, two to three hours long with an oscilloscope and a modular synth. 
right? So if you really want to dig it, I mean, I kind of prepared the oscilloscope. Maybe we'll view something about the neutrons. Probably a good idea to discover it a bit anyway. Because in fact, you know, if you start dealing with increasingly complex electronic systems, you have no clue what's going on. So your oscilloscope is like your main window. Obviously, you're hearing it. But in terms of achieving a certain result, for example, one of the one of those lectures I think is titled Experimental Compressor Patching, right? Because in a way, the principle of making very loud bits softer, right, and leaving the soft bits intact is something that you can achieve in many ways. You might be aware that every compressor is distorting because it's a nonlinearity, and actually every distortion is a dynamic process as well. They're kind of mates. Uh, and evidently, if I say experimental compressors, you're probably getting the hint they're not going to be, you know, great for lullaby vocals and stuff. It's going to be harsh, you know, destruction of the signal, fairly noisy stuff going on. But in a sense, very crucially useful because, at least in my perspective, you know, I'm just sick of hearing s separate engines. Right. We, we kind of have a, it's, it's an aesthetic of an engine that we're following since the 80s, since the, you know, the monkey came to the monolith and the monolith went boom, 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 boom in a steady pace and really loud and the monkey stand is like, wow, huge fascination with exact sequence, right? That's what happened as soon as we had these sequencers going. But you see how this is loosening. Right, uh, probably you're aware of uh, underground hip hop and the kind of rhythmical weirdness they're up to, you know. And you know, you all know about the swing control on your sequencer, right? So you're actually and the randomization that's coming in on big doors recently, you know, in Ableton you can randomize everything very neatly now. And in fact, randomization is crucial. Y you see how. For example, if I do 3D modeling and I have to create a model of my uh, beautiful haircut, right? What I do is I actually have a complex generative algorithm with many parameters, right? Fairly flexible and I can define it. I can say, well, the hairs in this area are between this length and that length. The color varies like this. These are a bit more gray for me by now. You know, and in this area, you have a gradient of density, right? <laughs> so from sparse, it gets denser, right? And then the length has its own random variety. And then you get the, you know, the color of each hair because it kind of changes along the length of it. Then you get the light that impacts it. Then you get the parameter when, I, when did I last use shampoo, which is probably about 10 years ago now. You know, there's huge amount of parameters a very complex, decent generative system, and you tune it all, and suddenly you have Zach's hair on a 3D model, and you know, he swings around and it swings around together with him. What do we do with hi hats? You know, we, we just loop it and hope that people are still fascinated by the regular sequence as much as they were 20, 30 years ago, and we discover, well, they might not be so fascinated with the steady sequence anymore. And then we take a randomizer and they're like, okay, I've randomized the velocity. Now think of the complexity of the generative algorithm for 3D hair, bloody hell. It's like miles, miles away. So evidently, I guess some of you easily, you know, may develop in this direction because you can do this. You can create a hi-hat machine which has a parameter sweaty hands. And then my stick slips in a very peculiar way. And what you can do is you can increase the sweaty hands as the track plays, right? And the drummer will struggle to keep the time and therefore compensate by, you know, letting loose in another way. And you have a kind of, a, you know, a, a decent texture, musical development. It can all make quite a lot of sense. And on the other hand, you know, you're just not stuck with mousing in all the hi-hat notes. Who wants to mouse in hi-hat notes, right? So one of the things that I've done as a, as a part of my studies uh, back in the day 
was generative uh, piano music. And uh, what you have is a school which would, you know, try to conceive of it and then build the conception. Like I said, with the sweaty hands is a good example, right? Because I would have to sit down and code it for a few days and think about it, make it work. But actually, you can do something like this. So what I'm doing is I'm not, I didn't look at the oscillator. I didn't look at the specs. I didn't, you know, do anything. I was just finding the general patch, the general link, connection of things, such that I have a playground, right? I made my sandpit. So with generative stuff, with these pieces, if you're interested, I can, uh, I can point you to it, uh, them. It's uh, such that I actually put, it's called one-to-many mapping. You might be aware of this. So I had maybe 10, 15 generative parameters, density of this, pitch of that, range of this, range of that. But then what I've done is I've taken three faders and each of them was mapped to five parameters at the same time, one-to-many mapping. And I've played with this mapping until I found my ideal sandbox. And I felt like, ooh, with these three faders, I can articulate a musical piece. It starts low, it starts soft, something changes. There's a, you know, a sense of suspension, then a radical change, then and again, you know, tuning things in detail and all the rest. So there's quite a lot. And I think you guys, I mean, you know, I'm, I hope I'm preaching to the converted in a way. You know, because, you know, how long can you stay fascinated with inserting notes into a sequencer? Depends. Depends on the stimulants on or tranquilizers that you might be on at the time. But eventually it will wear out, you know, and especially if you have kind of a techie brain, then, then it really uh, goes a long way. Okay, so back to the uh, neutron. So what does it have? So it has this many outputs, you can't really read it, so I'll, I'll talk you through it briefly. So this many outputs and this many inputs. Actually, this is two, four, six, seven, two, four, six, eight. Seven by eight is 50, 40, quite a lot of patch points, right? So what you have then is the ability to re-patch things to get weirdness going. Now, typically what I was planning and probably won't do because um, I have to leave you. If, if, you, if I you know, overdo it, you'll be like, okay, it was fun, but my head hurts right now. So I'll try to abruptly finish at some point. So one of the things that I was really keen to stick into the feedback loop is the inverter. I have an inverter here. I mean, typically some mixers would have a phase invert button as well, you know? So that does it right because if you push it up it push you down it's not that trivial because you know every wave has a trough and a peak it's it's a bit more complicated to truly grasp what's going on in fact it might be impossible in certain situations but definitely inverter if you take it home try it now there is a delay so in a lot of these configurations everyone uses delay it's my aesthetic choice that i like the raw filthy noises and as soon as I put delay, I feel like, you know, I've put mayo on pizza or something like this. I, I feel it gives, uh, gives an additional taste which just ruins the strong character that I'm after. But nevertheless, it's there. And you have the filters, which you can modulate, right? And that's the thing you can also play with in the sense that you can create control signals with the chaotic setup, right? So what I'm doing now is I'm creating chaotic synthesis, essentially, right? which goes between noise and oscillation and is both at the same time. You see, it comes back to those concepts. But you could also try to do you know, things where you actually create DC signals with this and then do that. Obviously, the whole EQ section and the rest is really tuned for audio rate, but never mind. Um, yeah, attenuator slew limiter can be quite uh, quite important, which is kind of rounding the wave off for you, okay? Because typically with this setup, you've heard it, it gets harsh, you know? So this kind of, essentially a slew rate limiter is a low pass filter, right? It's just a different set of parameters and, uh, and algorithms. There is an overdrive. <laughs> May you not have had enough from the setup. There is a noise output, which was a bit weird. I kind of looked at it. 
well, I did set it up. Let's give it uh, a bit of a look as well then. So I will um, hopefully oscilloscope some of these things. So here is my oscillator one. I hope there is an oscillator one. Oh yeah, I probably need to, uh, I'm not sure. Ooh. Okay. That's exciting. Because I'm seeing it and not uh, using this line three. Oh yes, of course, I plugged it into the input. Don't plug it like that. So that's my oscillator. Has different shapes and uh, range. The, the thing is, I think I've mentioned, I'm, I'm running a, a MIDI note from Ableton right now into it, which kind of determines the pitch. And you probably gather that I'm a bigger fan of low pitch than high pitch. I mean, in the kind of noisy world, you know, high pitches are fairly meanest. Uh, okay, get me back to my oscilloscope, please. Okay. So that's your standard thing there, but I think because this is a semi-modular, it means that, I have no clue, I'm just discovering it, that the filter is already connected, uh, but it seems like it's not. Okay, so I may want to connect it myself. So we can do a bit of patching that we're here. Okay, so I should be able to take the output of the oscillator plug it into the VCF, VCF, shape, 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 LFO trigger. I mean, this is not my weapon of choice, evidently. But I'm VCF in, okay. And then I can, should be able to just take the VCF out, okay. So now it seems like it's modulated by this LFO as well. So evidently, you know, read the manual, use the thing. And then obviously I'm aiming to uh, send it through the rest of the rig. It would be neat if I could get some, some serious So I may try, let's see what happens. What I'll try to do then is I will um, plug the another output. Right. So I'm plugging another output into the inverter. Inverter is crucial for this stuff. Uh, I'll make you chill for a bit if I find it at all. Invert in, there we go. And then I will plug the inverter out into another track. Okay, so this is the stage before. And then with the inverter. Oh yeah.
trying to get 132 BPM, you understand it, right? <laughs> So as a matter of comparison, I'll just play you this again so you see how it sounds again. And then I'll quickly, instead of the inverter, I'll patch in the slew limiter, right? So it's kind of supposed to do the, you know, the right thing and chill out a bit. be able to go to the toilet and you know machine keeps you entertained and a bit of an outro that's that thank you guys and uh, evidently, questions taken now, next year. I'm teaching abroad in the second semester, so you won't me see me around the corridors much. But uh, yeah, maybe one day the noise lab will live again and all the rest. Cool, thanks for coming.